Yeah, it was the highest grossing film to date okay. when it came out. He's like, are you ready? Because your life is going to completely change. And I was like, yes, bring it. And it was wild to be under that kind of worldwide scrutiny. For what was it, 118 days or whatever right. it was, yeah. you know, that we stood in solidarity. And I really felt proud of being a union member um, and, and them having our back. I mean, that's the other thing, too. Like, we need to stand together as union members so that they can support us in the ways that we need to be supported. What's up, world? It's your boy, Big Court, of the Holding Court Podcast, and I'm here with the with the gang gang. Mm-hmm. What's up uh, to my oldest daughter, uh, baby Rachel? We are finally, we're diversifying. Yes, Holding for court. sure. We, we expanding, right? <laughs> we expanding. We've been here. <laughs> yeah, all right. He's like, I was just so. Well, what did you for what? What did you forget? Did you forget? I do. You forget. just like I forget sometimes. Yeah, we've been, we been here and producer Ken in the house. The question: Why isn't she named Court as well? I was just wondering that. You know, well, what? we were talking. Or, well, we'll introduce our guests in a second, but why isn't she also Court? This, I don't know. You know, and the funny thing is, is she should be the one that that should be named. Court. Yes, exactly. Because yeah, she's the most like me and looks most like me. Yeah. So it was just who knows? I, I was sixteen. Y'all me, y'all yeah, <laughs> yes. me yep, named yep, her. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. I was almost name. Rebecca. Yeah. Oh really? Oh god. I no, was you were Rebecca. almost. Uh, it was a name that I wanted to oh, name, but you. No, it was an R name. I can't remember. Rebecca. Raquel. I wanted oh. to name oh, you Raquel, nice but your mother didn't like Raquel. some chick named Raquel. So that's why that happened. Well, I still get called Raquel, depending on the person, mother. It's okay. All, right. All good, but we, we have got a legendary guest. Yes, a yes. legendary for the culture. guest. Very, yes. very special guest. For my culture. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly. getting bad. Hold on, I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> uh, very, very special guest that mm-hmm. I can't believe is is here. Yeah. Like, you know, I can't believe Thank it's here, you. but it's true. Uh we have, uh, y'all know who this woman is. If you're looking at her, I know y'all wilding out like, oh, that's, you know. <laughs> The beautiful, incomparable Miss Christina Loken. Thank you so much. Very happy to be yes, here. Yes, yes. I, I appreciate you, you know, taking your time to come because I know you were coming from another shoot. So My pleasure. I appreciate you making that happen and accommodating. And um, yes, okay, no further ado. Uh, we got to give a shout out to Chris LeVar, the homie Chris LeVar. Indeed, um, yep. Okay, Chris. Um, uh, Chris, my friend, Chris LeVar, and the youngest ring announcer in the world, Cameron Michael, a.k.a. Killer Cam. There you go, Chris. <laughs> did you have to read that? I did. <laughs> he sent that to you? Yeah, he asked me to say it. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, he connected That's the, the dots. That's the company you keep. Yeah, he connected <laughs> the dots. So, you know what I mean? Apparently, I don't know. Chris so I, is is a very talented man. Yes, he, yes. He Chris really is the is. homie. With his freestyling, it's it's impressive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Chris is the yeah. homie. Uh, I met Chris through. Uh, we have a mutual friend. We have two mutual friends, Ice T and Tiny. R. And R. so, yeah, R.I.P. to the homie Tiny uh, Debo. And so I met Chris because Debo uh, uh, Tiny, mm-hmm. he was putting together a project that he had both uh, Chris and I on. Okay. And so that's where me and Chris met. So shout out to the homie. That's we appreciate nice. you, Chris. Um, but yes, Christana, mm-hmm. Christana, uh, man, legendary actress, uh, still in the game, still doing things. Yep. W- Haven't gone crazy yet. Yeah. <laughs> very, very, very There's some sanity actually in the last day or so. <laughs> yeah. Kind yeah. Of. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very outspoken. It's, it's funny. I, as I was kind of doing some research, I was like, oh, she got a little fire in her. She, she say what she mean. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. My um, my older sister has always um, underscored that point is to really stand up for what you believe in yeah. and speak your truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and nobody which, can fault you on that then in the end because it's what you believe. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which you have done. I, I went and looked. I was like, OK, yeah, she she don't pull no punches. But I want to start from the beginning a little bit just to touch on your background. So um, you're Norwegian and... Uh, German. German. Yeah. German. But you grew up in Ghent. Yes. The metropolis of Ghent. No, I'm joking. It's it's (laughs) like you blink and you've gone through it. But yes, I grew up on a fruit farm in upstate New York that my parents had for 43 years called Love Apple Farm. And it was a big summer and fall destination for families. Um, Pick your own fruit, gourmet roadside market, bakery, petting zoo for kids. Um, Mm. It was really 
an idyllic childhood. Mm -hmm. This is upstate New York? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I just realized that there's a lot of like farmland. You always think of New York as like mm -hmm. New York. Yeah, for sure. But my brother in law, his family owns like the largest like pepper farm in the US. <laughs> And mm. it's all upstate New York, too. Yeah, people think in New York and they just think of the city. But, um, yeah, upstate is absolutely gorgeous. And ironically, um, I was just back up there um, shooting a film mm -hmm. um, called Dark Night of the Soul uh, that we can mm. talk about later. Oh, but absolutely. it was really nice to be back um, only 40 minutes away. I got to visit the farm mm. again because it's even though my parents have sold it, it's still an operation and visit some friends. And um, Hudson is the nearest, closest, you know, city. Yeah. And uh, it's really a happening weekend spot for New Yorkers and second home spot for New Yorkers now. But um, there's a lot going on there. And it is the third oldest city in New York State. The whales used to come that far up the Hudson River. So it was an old whale oil village. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Did you actually grow up farming? <clears throat> like oh, yeah. I mean, it was it's a big farm. Yeah. So you milk cows? <clears throat> fruit farm. Oh, fruit farm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were the largest. <laughs> yeah, not a dairy farm. Not Missouri, not no. us. <laughs> well, when I think of farm, I think of like everything. Goats, mm -hmm. like cows, hay, yeah. horses, yeah. you know. Well, we did have a petting zoo, okay. uh, which came later. But um, no, it was a big fruit farm, uh, over 26 varieties of apples, largest mm -hmm. peach growers in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Um, my dad was a real pioneer with the, the way in which and style of how he picked fruit. You've probably heard the term tree ripe. That was his phrase. He coined that, oh, really? which means you essentially pick the same tree several times to ensure the quality and the ripeness of the fruit. Mm -hmm. He was also a pioneer with the cloudy cider, you know, right before it was just apple juice. Mm -hmm. And now we drink apple cider. Um, so he had apple cider and made hard apple cider. Love apple farms, love juice, may cause amorous behavior was the catchphrase <laughs> on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, they had a lot of fun with the farm. This is involved yeah. in big fruit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Big pharma, big fruit. <laughs> I'm not Jeez. gonna. I'm not gonna go on with that joke. <laughs> as a, I'm curious, as a kid, um, were you always into the arts? Were you always into like? Did you start with innocent pretending and different things like that? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, as far back as I can remember, um, I wanted to be an actress. Mm -hmm. So when I was young, I did various different types of um, lessons of dance, different types of dance lessons, and then horseback riding, and um, then voice lessons, and I did summer stock theater, and <clears throat> excuse me, various things. Um, and then uh, when I was 13, I was watching uh, that film Beethoven uh, with the big St. Bernard, yeah, and there was a girl in it yeah. who was about my age, Nicole Tom, she ended up becoming a friend of mine after I moved out here, mm -hmm. ironically. But I said to my parents, how do I get to do that? Mm -hmm. And so my dad had been an actor. He's also a writer, still is. Wow. My mother had been a model. Um, and he said, let me take you into New York and I can introduce you to Monty Silver, which was his old agent. And I met him. And they said, okay, great, we'll, we'll take you on. And they said, as a matter of fact, there's an audition that we think you'd be right for um, that's happening today or tomorrow, whenever it was, for a soap opera, As the World Turns. Oh. And uh, I went into that audition, and I read with um, my, my little love interest, you know, teenage love interest on the show, Jason Biggs from the American Pie, mm -hmm. later mm -hmm. fame. Yeah. And um, we did our scene, and I remember him being very interested in the kissing part of the scene. <laughs> um, but I ended up getting the job. And I thought, well, like, this is really easy, you know? I mean, little did I know it was beginner's luck. And yeah. um, But anyway, that was my first job and uh, went from there. How nervous were you for that, the first on-camera on kiss? You know, it's funny. I, I, I never really mm -hmm. was. Like, mm -hmm. to me, I, I've always, I, I, I really enjoy performing so okay. there wasn't even yeah. a yeah. thought about so even that. at that young age you were able to separate the pretend from real life yeah okay hopefully yeah. <laughs> hopefully i still am but sometimes it's hard i mean yeah. i to be honest you know i've done a lot of um 
characters that, uh, like the one I just did with Dark Knight of the Soul 2, who's going through a, really a, a deep, emotional, traumatic, basically looking death in the face over the course of a night. Mm -hmm. Dark Knight of the Soul is taken from a poem, which essentially means it's your own um, catharsis to come to terms with death to make it into the afterlife. Mm -hmm. And this is a woman who has a high position at the CDC. It's a pandemic. She can't find the cure, and her husband and daughter were patient one and two. Mm. She gets into a car accident, her legs bleeding out. So suffice to say, this is not a romantic comedy. You know, this right. is a very intense <laughs> yeah. experience. It's, you know, it's, you know, my kind of 127 hours or castaway or mm. something like that. So when you go through this emotional process of what the character is going through, um, it takes a while for me to like come out of that um, in my own life and just let it go again. Mm. Did you did you take acting classes? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I've taken a lot of classes through the years. I've had some some really wonderful teachers okay. for sure. Did you start in theater as well as most actors? I did growing up when I was young mm -hmm. in upstate New York, mm -hmm. um, and then moved into TV and film. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, I asked most of our guests this, and it'd be an interesting question to ask you. What type of music did you grow up listening to, and were you exposed to hip hop? We we started off as a music podcast, yeah. so it's gonna go music a little. <laughs> bit. Of course, of course, yeah. I love music. Um, of course, I I totally grew up around hip hop, mm -hmm. but um, it wasn't my go to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say it was more, uh, in like my teen years of mm -hmm. grunge rock, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, I Nirvana, also, yeah, dire. Nirvana, nice. you know, um, uh, Pearl Jam. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Remember yeah. all of them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Pearl Jam um, was hard. Yeah. <laughs> I play Pearl Jam. For sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Um, Smashing Pumpkins, yeah. huge fan. Um, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yeah, exactly. See, when I think about all of them, I think about when MTV used to do the spring break things. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, break. yeah, for and sure. And they would always have the, the, the bands and stuff. That was my mm -hmm. I feel my like Nirvana was before that, though. Mm -hmm. Nirvana. Mm -hmm. No, they definitely were. Yeah. They definitely were. But when, like, Red Hot Chili Peppers and mm -hmm. yeah. some Pearl Jam, some of them other guys. I was Grunge thinking, feels like Seattle to me. <laughs> Oh, straight like, Seattle. Yeah, Northwest. Yeah. Straight Seattle. That was the birthplace of it. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. That's that's what I think of when I think of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I was I had was living in Seattle oddly at that time. For mm -hmm. like one year I lived mm -hmm. up there while Kurt Cobain before he blew his head off or yeah. whatever happened to him. Right. Um we were oh, up just there. just like that, huh? Before he blew his head off. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think he OD'd actually. Mm -hmm. I, I thought he thought he shot himself. Yeah, yeah I thought really? so I too. too. I thought it was with a shotgun. Oh really? Yeah, I think I think it was like pretty Okay. Oh shit. I mean Rest in peace, Kurt Cobain. Yes. He, he was dealing with yeah. depression. And right, yeah, right. yeah and maybe so. it was. I, I but uh, but no, yeah, I always think that Seattle is like grunge mm. headquarters. It like, is. It definitely is. Did you like is. classic rock? Yeah, I was going to say, I also liked um, some classic rock for sure. Um, always been a big like Sting fan. Mm -hmm. And the Police. I love and the some Police. Some of the more yeah. like retro 80s yeah. bands as oh, well. Oh yeah, 80s is where um, I live. I just saw Sting at the Bowl. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. my top five five concerts. Um, also too, like Fleetwood Mac. Huge okay. Fleetwood mm -hmm. Mac fan. Also yeah. seen mm -hmm. them at the Bowl. Absolutely incredible. That probably was my number one. Um, concert. Uh, and then I also have always liked classical music. Like mm. I've listened to a lot of classical music in my life and it started in the teen years. Um, plus I have a sister who's 16 years older. So I was influenced by her love of disco mm -hmm. and that kind of vibe. So mm -hmm. which then transferred into house and electronica, mm -hmm. um, which I really love now. Yeah. Can you sing? I could sing. I mean, I certainly wouldn't call myself a singer, okay. but for a role, yeah, for okay. sure. You can carry a, a tune. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I, we were talking out there and I, uh, if people don't know, you know, because they're seeing you on camera, you're very tall. Uh, yes. <laughs> you're 5'11". Mm -hmm. Right. So were you, is, were you always, did you get the, a growth spurt early on, which helped you transition into modeling? I've always been tall. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was always one of the tallest girls in my class. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, yeah, started. I actually started um, acting first at okay. 13, but then um, was approached for modeling. And since my mom had been a model, she said, you know, it's a great way to, to make mm -hmm. money and save up for college. And so I modeled all over the world, but really always came back to the roots and the foundation of my mm -hmm. passion for acting. What is that world like? I mean, being a fashion model. Mm -hmm. You know, it really, it, it wasn't for me. I'm not really into fashion, to be honest, mm -hmm. you know, and, and giving to an inanimate object wasn't very gratifying to me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I love people. Mm -hmm. I'm a people person. Mm -hmm. I love interacting with humanity. I love learning from people, all of that. So, and studying people and, you know, that's of course how you create a character. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the, the modeling world was, uh, it, it's tough, you know, yeah. it's, it's very superficial. You have to have a really thick skin, you know, you, right. think you have to have a thick one in acting. It's like, I think in, in modeling even yeah. more so. But what I did love about it is I did travel to some amazing places and also um, body awareness in front of the camera mm -hmm. really helped in that connection and also just doing... Um, just being a very outdoors, active, sporty person, like I said, with the dance background, um, all of that really helped um, with ultimately being in front of the camera. Right. Were you signed to an agency, like a modeling agency, when you were doing yes, that? Yes, I was with Elite, okay. John Casablancas, and um, I did the Look of the Year contest in Ibiza. Oh, nice. I beat Giselle. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. All right. There you go. She's flexing. She's amazing. Yeah, she she's, ama she's amazing. Uh, she's flexing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, this may be somewhat of a, a silly question. Um, as a model, did you ever feel objectified? Uh, totally. Okay. Yeah. How did you How did you deal? Were you able to kind of turn that off and just say, "Hey, it's business. I'm selling something." And and keep you know, it it's a great question because I think it's something that you sadly get used to. Mm -hmm. And I really don't think, for me, it was until the whole Me Too movement came around where I was like, "Oh," and I'm an adult, you mm -hmm. know. But you still as a woman, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you deal with this too all yes. the time, and although things have changed a lot, especially in the last five to 10 years, but you just, it's like water off a duck's back. You mm -hmm. know, you, you get so accustomed to the comments, to mm -hmm. the, the touchy feely yep. aspect of it, exactly. <laughs> and you just kind of, ah, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. Hold on, what is it? People's touching? <laughs> <laughs> See, Uncle Ken. Right? Yeah, Uncle there Ken. you go. Oh, my God. Well, we got some shit for them. <laughs> That's right. Oh, this is um, like my family. I've known her since she was a baby. So. <laughs> now, hold on. I've been working. Who's You're touching? Like, what? Who's of course. Touching? Yeah. I know Dad ain't letting that slide either. Oh, no, no. Nah. But I really, I really commend um, the woman, the women who have come forward and have spoken out against um, the abuse mm -hmm. because really it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, what was the the book and the film that just came out recently um, that the two New York Times reporters wrote? Do you remember what the name of that film was? Mm -hmm. um, mm -mm. Gosh, it's escaping me right now. But I read the book, and and the movie it was about Weinstein, mm. and and um, uh, I saw the Netflix series. I don't know if it's the same one. What was that one called? It wasn't. It wasn't surviving. But they showed like the whole conglomerate of how they were able to get these young girls and how they set up the girls also to bring in more women that were their age. I don't was know that with the same. Epstein thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. That that would have been a oh, different exposure. Yes, yeah. So many. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, right. Many. That's right. crazy. Yeah. It's it, it's bothering me that I can't. You find the title for me. Please. She okay. said. She said. Thank mm -hmm. you. She That's said. it. You got yeah. it. Yeah. Um. But it it was like it really that really sunk into me and um you know I think also too as you grow older and mature you also look at your own participation and, and how you mm -hmm. present yourself and how mm -hmm. you dress and mm -hmm. all of these things. Ooh, but... don't get in trouble now. Because mm -hmm. you know, women don't like that. Women don't like hearing how you present yourself can garner it's different true. attention, but it is true. But it is true. Yes, yeah, it is. Right? It's not, yeah, that... like mm -hmm. what are you selling, <sighs> right. you know, mm -hmm. and exactly. and why are yeah. you selling it? Mm -hmm. So it's it's been an education <clears throat> and, and I think the generation coming up, and I notice 
people that are younger than me, it's mm. the way in which they approach women yeah. and is totally different now. Mm. Yeah, you know. I, mean, I think if you dress the part, they give you the role, yes. you know, I mean, it, it's the same way for men, even if you look in the, you know, in the urban aspect of the culture, you know, you can have a lot of these uh, suburban kids that are not from the hood, they're not from the gang life, but it becomes fashionable. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So if they, I was just seeing a if inter they, interview about a white kid from like Rancho Palo Verdes who mm -hmm. was like hanging out with the Crips mm -hmm. and gotten all this trouble. Yeah. And yeah. ended up getting shot. If you at. if you yeah. wear the uniform, so yeah. it's kind of to that same right. thing. So if you if you look like a gangbanger, you're walking mm -hmm. up the street and you wonder why the police is you know kind of tripping with you or you getting banged on. Well, you have on the uniform. So right. I don't know though, man. It's I feel like I don't know. I'm a guy speaking. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a little more nuanced than the because I think w women were catching it. Definitely, they were went, they were being objectified. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a little. Yeah. Bit. I, I mean, I've worked now. It's like my 23rd year, mm -hmm. and I. Not sadly, because I knew nothing about it, but I worked with Weinstein mm -hmm. in the at the Cannes Film Festival on a PR hmm. run for I think it was Kill Bill. Um, but I, it's 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 yeah, it's not it's deeper than like if you look the part they give you the role because I think women were just being objectified. No, that's true. I, that's you, here's, the, here's, here's the thing: I grew up a, with a mother who raised me, a grand. I didn't. My dad was not absent, but he didn't raise me. I grew up raising my baby sister that you know, mm -hmm. and by my mom and my grandma. So I always had a reverence and respect for women, as right. I know you did with mm -hmm. your connection to your mom and having mm -hmm. your daughters. Mm -hmm. I think some men just don't have it. No, yeah, and, for sure. And, That's true. And in this industry, they were taking advantage of that, mm -hmm. taking advantage Absolutely. of the position of power. Yep. Oh yeah, and yeah. Total abuse that, of like, power. Yeah. You know, you know, the heart of men yeah, can be sure. wicked. Yeah. For sure, can be wicked. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> I think, regardless, like. Yeah. You could have them in full. Garb no, that's right. That's right. And, and I was about to say not to justify it at yeah. all, but I'm saying that that doesn't help it. Of course, you know yeah. I mean? yeah, it doesn't help. Because as a woman, you feel it. Like I can feel like if I'm dressed like this versus when I have on like a skirt, but not in like a work setting, but just in life. Like you mm -hmm. do feel the difference, and you can observe the different demographics totally. of men that approach you, how they approach you, mm -hmm. right? You know things mm -hmm. like that, but. My question to you is in this industry and especially with modeling, like did that help you learn to establish boundaries and set boundaries or did it come after? Did you always kind of have it just your journey with boundary setting as a beautiful woman in that industry, in those industries? What's a boundary? <laughs> I'm still learning. She said, I got I'm to get <laughs> um, No, I, honestly, I mean, that's that's not a total joke, but yeah. I think growing up, in the industry that I have from such a young age, you know, I think I've got it pretty much figured out at this point, yeah. but you know, it's taken, it's taken a while mm -hmm. because those lines were really skewed, right? right. You want people to like you, mm -hmm. you want to get the job and obviously not compromising yourself, right. but, mm -hmm. right. and that's why I say you have to learn the balance within yourself mm -hmm. because also too, there's a certain, expectation that mm -hmm. people have in how you present yourself, yes. in what you say and what you do. Less so now, but mm -hmm. certainly it was different before. Mm -hmm. Did you ever come across the Weinstein cat? Um, I have, I have met him. Okay. Yeah. But in a, you know, in a social oh, I environment. See. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was in Cannes. Actually. I think you and I would also just call like the dudes that fall into that. Like it's just as dudes, like mm -hmm. yeah, you know For what sure. I mean. Like a, no, a, a, a guy like you, yeah. a guy like me, like I, I feel like I have a respect for women. Right. I've I've always I've, like a serial monogamous. I've dated mm -hmm. and dated and dated. I'm, I'm not out there like a predator trying. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's just like as dudes who no, will really like sure. be like, oh, that's some power, and I can make this young girl. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is like yeah. that. And I Everywhere. think I think of that in any as we talk about like the social dynamics of race relations in this country. Mm -hmm. Like anybody who exploits. Like mm -hmm. people of color, yeah, right. women, or whatever. It's kind of like a test yeah, it like, yeah, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, so yeah. you're gonna, you don't play that card. <laughs> right. And then, right. and like, I know who you are. Like, I know, and you run across it in this industry all the time. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm a white guy. So we, mm -hmm. we've talked about this a lot. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in a position where, yeah, I understand the privilege and, right. and the power that comes with that. And I try mm -hmm. to, I try to like tread lightly and right. give people opportunity and not, be one of the guys that would be looked at like that but it's it's out there it's out yeah. it's, it ain't just weinstein it's mm -hmm. yeah it was a Have, culture i believe yes. oh absolutely that, that started absolutely. to get it's been around forever yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and i'm sure in your 
in your journey, you've encountered that probably quite a bit. Yeah. 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 How do you how do you deal with it? Like to any young actresses that mm-hmm. could be watching this, like how do you navigate that? I would just say um, know your own power mm-hmm. and know that you don't have to accept that. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to pray into that to get the job. You know, if that's what the expectation is, you don't want that job anyway, right. you know, and you don't have to. But I would also educate um, younger women to also be aware of how you're presenting yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you selling? If you're going in to a business meeting, of course, if you're going for a certain role that, you know, is a, is a prostitute or Mm -hmm. a call girl or a Mm -hmm. stripper or something, then you, you presenting yourself in one way. Right. But if you're going into a business meeting to pitch a script, right. you know, don't wear the mini skirt with mm-hmm. the cleavage, right. you know, and the platforms. It's like you just <laughs> yes. you right. want to be taken seriously. Yeah. So so also know what your own level of participation is in that. Right, right. And that's so messed up because in a perfect world, I mean one should be able to dress as they want of to. Of course. Right? True. In a perfect yeah. world. But yeah. no, we don't yeah. live in that world. I know, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that's not our culture. I can't right. tell you how many sure. times I've gone in to like um because I also produce pitch a script or something and you know I'll be with a, a gentleman whomever that person is and and then it'll be like oh maybe we could go to dinner and yep. you know I can, we could talk more about it that's you know? where it starts huh? yeah. exactly just putting a toe yeah. in the water Let me right see. yeah Let me see yeah what that mm-hmm. Is. Mm-hmm. okay <laughs> I think because you've met my you you know I know your wife and you've uh-huh. met my six my ex-wife and I've always just been on maybe it's just because I've always been tied in with someone I've always yeah. just no dinner talk, no nut, just all business. I do the Keanu Reeves. Have you, have you seen the pictures of him where he's like very standoffish? <laughs> Always has been. Mm. Very respectful. Mm. He won't like put his arm around someone in a photo. Like go look hard yes. at Keanu Reeves photos. Okay. If he's with like a young lady. Yeah. He's not even touching it. He's kind of <laughs> yeah. like, and he's been like that forever. Yeah. Like, shout That's out. That's smart. To, now That's a smart. lot of people will ask, which they mm-hmm. never used to. Yeah. Like, can I put my arm around you mm-hmm. for a photo? You right. know, and that's that's nice. You know, yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've I may always need to been start like doing that. that. I never. I just assume. Just nah. <laughs> I've yeah. I've always been like that. I might, yeah, I might have to start doing that. It's real. <laughs> they they circle it on social media. It was trending. Like it's, it was like this. Right, yeah, 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 right. And it, there's yeah. like a gap of yeah. air yeah. in between yeah. the person. But I, I'm going to start today. It, I'm going to start with you, Christina. Okay. Today, I'm going to get my Keanu. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could ask. I mean, I think once you you yes. know you have an interaction have with someone, yeah. you know, yeah. then you're like, okay, you can yeah. post yes. in a picture together. But you know, I think even still, just good But I don't even think he was doing. I don't even think he was doing. This is pre me too. Mm-hmm. I think he, it was just a respect thing, like mm-hmm. yeah. a boundary of like I'm not gonna right. Yes. I'm not gonna like grab upon you or hug upon you or wow. whatever else. Because guys don't do it with each other. Like in the industry, nah. I've met so many people. We're not like all. Oh, arms nah. around each other's way but i have stopped a few people from i don't like people well i'm usually taller than most people but i don't like people to put their arm up on my shoulder you know when they do that they be trying to like like you just shelf or some <laughs> I, don't like, I don't like it that's I that was, big dog thing i don't I was like man move your arm i don't think many people could well if you've got basketball players yeah or no nah, i've had I, they'd be short they'd like this yeah it'd be, it'd be shorter guys they try He's to talk like, about me i do it <laughs> I mean, he family. He could do it. But I'm talking yeah. about like strangers, folks. Yeah. I don't. I don't like that. I just yeah. think there's a there's there, in that whole conversation, there's just a respect missing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. There's yeah. just a respect missing for each other as like humans. And no, that's true. That's men, true. women, people of all races. Like yeah. just just a general yeah. respect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I don't think some people grow up with it. It's different. Like we we're growing up in a different era now, mm-hmm. and you know, like I we have, I have interracial kids. Yeah. You just teach people like. Respect for women, how to be a humanity, man, yeah. Yeah. humanity yeah. culture. Like, yeah, exactly. My current girlfriend is Jewish, and like my kids are learning about what's going on right now by right. interacting with her and her son. It's just like there's such a lack of human yes. decency left. Oh, that's right. Mm. Where you're just like, oh, kids are asking about cultural things going on. Mm-hmm. Why are they bombing this? And why it's like, well, oh, man, because <laughs> there's somebody who wants power and control and. Mm-hmm. And I was driving through Topanga Canyon today and I saw a sign that said, love thy neighbor. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, 
so simple and beautiful and true and it really stuck with me and first of all i thought it's really interesting that someone felt that they needed to put that sign up there yeah. like yeah. there was a reason <laughs> why they posted that for people to read mm -hmm. um and it's it's just a really simple message i wonder that, what yeah. that's attributed to you know in terms of just the loss of respect for humanity and life like the other day i was at chipotle and i saw this homeless guy uh sitting at the little outside table I ain't gonna lie, I thought he was dead, right? But I was thinking to myself, nobody stopped but me. Hmm. You know, yeah. no, nah, I'm not gonna lie. Maybe 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have, right? But as I've gotten older, I've learned to kind of appreciate yeah. uh, and value humanity and human life. So I stop, I go over to him, I tap him, you know, and then I'm like, damn, dude, feel a little stiff. I'm like, damn, I hope this dude ain't dead, oh you know? Cause now I gotta stay and like talk to the people, right? Mm -hmm. And I have somewhere to be, but, I'm like pushing, I'm like, damn, I think dude is dead. You know, so I'm like, oh man. But I was tripping in, in real time. Like so many people had walked by him not to even check on him. So finally I got down and I said, okay, I don't want to pull him up. So I got down and he was breathing, you know, mm -hmm. he was breathing slow, but he breathing. was breathing. So then- <laughs> He was passed out. I, yes. Uh -huh. So he was on something. So I ain't gonna, I, listen. So what I did was it was like a little fork that was on there. I stuck the fork in his neck and in, in, in his in his mouth, <laughs> and I gagged him a little bit. And he got up, and he was. What are you he, doing, bro? <laughs> but no, I just wanted to make, make no. Sure you no, listen. I just conversation want, going. No, no, listen. I uh, wanted to make sure he wasn't dying. Yes. I wanted people. to make sure he wasn't dying. You know <laughs> oh. what I mean? And so when he got up, I said, "Bro, you good?" He was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm fine." I said, oh, "Okay." Just want to make sure. Yeah. So I. Yeah. You're out there stabbing homeless guys. He's like, forts. I'm sleeping well tonight. But yes, there it is, yeah. right there. Yep. I couldn't, in good conscience, yep. walk away from him. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If, if and then if I'd have looked on the news, like, oh, you know, God found dead. And I'm like, damn, I just that's walked by him like he was nothing. If it wouldn't have been on the news, they would have just huh. yeah, just that's him up and that's you know, um, right on. this is an interesting segue. But um, I did a film you earlier. Also, this... we're at a Chipotle. No, no, <laughs> no, no. Uh, earlier this year, called No Address, and it's mm -hmm. about the homeless crisis in America right now. It is for sure a crisis. And um, we in LA have the largest mm -hmm. in-city homeless population in the entire U.S. Sixty thousand homeless people. Wow. And we all saw through COVID how it just mm -hmm. snowballed. I mean, you yeah. saw homeless people where you never ever, whole encampments mm -hmm. where yeah. you never saw them before. Right. Yeah. So, all in my neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Sherman Oaks. Yeah, Sherman and, it, Oaks. and it's it's everywhere. You would think yeah. it's just like Skid Row. Mm -hmm. Man, wow. listen, it's Encino, it's Beverly Hills. Right. It's everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So, I saw the craziest thing. They put on Devonshire and Balboa in Northridge, mm -hmm. they set up an encampment down Devonshire and then they started putting tents in mm -hmm. turning lane in the street. Oh wow! Wow! They just there was there was somebody sleeping in there mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. I was like, he it's in the street. Mm. And Not it even on there. the medium. No, in the like right far right hand mm -hmm. lane of wow. Devonshire at Balboa, wow. they'd start putting tents in the street where yeah. cars would typically drive. So oh, that's crazy. And they were just staying there. There was like feet hanging out. But like, what's crazy what is, is how on? even this country we have money to send to these other countries for aid and all of this and or we bail out we, car manufacturers yeah but or, for yeah. some reason we don't have the resources to you know to house these homeless and i understand it could be challenging because some of that is rooted in mental illness mental you know yeah. some of these people want to be where they are unfortunately you know yeah. some of them but um, the, yeah there really should be a rehabilitation mm -hmm. program you know for mental health and also mm -hmm. substance abuse i mean i think mm -hmm. those are the two leading factors mm -hmm. and so my friend who made this film julia verdon she got on a tour bus <clears throat> with a homeless expert and she went to 17 different cities interviewing people from the homeless communities and she did a documentary and then based upon their stories, she wrote a scripted feature and that's when we did uh, Shot No Address. So all of the stories that you see of the characters in the film um, were people that she actually met. Okay. Um, so we're really, and we shot it in Sacramento. Oh. And during the monsoon. Nice. And you know, these people were living through that in That's their tents crazy. or whatever, when we were having all that flooding and rain and water and- Sacramento's um, got a crazy homeless problem. Yeah. On a street called Roseville Road by my house is just, and can't, 
mm-hmm. looks like a city. Now. Yeah, it was it was staggering what yeah. we saw. So hopefully we'll raise some awareness with that. Speaking of uh, mental illness, um, you being in Hollywood and then also being from somewhere else and not having family out here, um, how do you balance uh, like dealing with the holidays coming? You know, how do you deal with being away from family? and just work-life balance would be in, in Hollywood? Yeah, it's also a great question. Um, I'm blessed now to have family nearby. So my parents sold the farm 10 years ago mm-hmm. and they moved out here. And then my sister and her wife live in Ventura, so it's not far. Oh, cool. um, and they've been out here for, gosh, well, at least 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because there's, this business is not stable. And I made that joke earlier about, you know, still having my sanity Mm -hmm. through all these years. Um, But it's true. I mean, I've seen so many of my contemporaries crash and burn Mm -hmm. and lose everything to for whatever reason. Um, So I think you have to have you have to create that internal grounding within yourself, Mm -hmm. Um, because without that, I. I mean, I think any any profession in life, you really need that. But this more than anything, mm-hmm. because you're creating all these characters that are really out there. You know, mm-hmm. you've it's you can have a feast or famine lifestyle. You're you know you're working, mm-hmm. you're making all this money, and then there's nothing. You know, and how mm-hmm. do you how do you balance and maintain that? Or you know, you're on set and you're needed. You know, 15 hours a day, and then the movie or the show is over, and then you're at home, and it's mm-hmm. like crickets. You know, mm-hmm. so how do you balance those extremes, right? Mm-hmm. And so for me, I found meditation early yeah. on in life, and that really helped ground me. Um, and I think uh, definitely my just my inspiration and drive for my craft and what I do, I absolutely love it. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes it's gone up and down, but anytime I've questioned what else would I do. There's nothing else that I would be this passionate about for yeah. sure. Right. And then, of course, now having a son who's mm-hmm. seven years old, that'll ground you. Yeah, well, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. A seven year old, too? Yeah. Son. Yeah. Driving me crazy. We'll have to get them together. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's been a beautiful journey, of course, with my most important role now as mother yeah. um, to really be there and show up for him and mm-hmm. be the best version of me that I can be. And yeah. you got that incredible opportunity at a young age. I did. I did. That's amazing. That's a different journey too to us. Yeah. It Stuff, is. Yeah. I tell people it is. Um, I watched them go through most of it. Yeah. It it, it shapes you um, because what people don't realize, and I think I thought about this as I got older, I've been a parent literally 85% of my life. Wow. I've been responsible for someone else for 85% of my life, you know? So. Um, Hi. Hey. <laughs> here yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Here she still is right here on my on my on my leg right mm-hmm. um but you know I'm, I'm thankful for that though you know I, I think it it matured me uh at a time where I really needed to be mature you know because I always say that if I didn't have her and and of course with her mom loving on me and and being a positive influence on me oh, I probably great. would be dead or in jail yeah. I'm pretty sure of let it. Let me get this. We always do the show to give someone else flowers, but let me give this man flowers because I met him after he came from Kansas City. So I wasn't there at the beginning of this. Mm-hmm. But she was still a baby. Eight, mm-hmm. nine? Yeah, I was yeah. ten. Yep, just turned ten. Mm-hmm. S- this man has been an incredible father since, since the day I met him. Still who he is and still very much yeah. Kansas City and street. Mm-hmm. I met him when he was still a gangster rapper. <laughs> had the grades yeah. and everything. But I had my kids later in life, and I mm-hmm. always – People ask me like, "Oh man, you're a good father." And I'm like, "You know, what's weird is, although we come from, because mm-hmm. I, I grew up in music too, I and mean, we met kind of through that. But like, like I've been blessed. I have good mm-hmm. fathers to look at as friends mm-hmm. and be like, well, yeah, you could still be from where we're from and be a good father. Like, yeah, for sure. And I would always be like, Court is an incredible father. And, and you know, it's not about it's not about perfection either. You know, yeah. because you make you're gonna make mistakes. Yeah. There's no handbook for parenting, right? No. It's the easiest thing in the world to f- up and get wrong. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. And oh. espe- yeah. especially when you're a, a kid having a kid, you know. Mm. Uh, and and then compound that with not having a reference point because hmm. I didn't grow up with my dad. I didn't grow oh. up with a father being demonstrated sure. and what that looked like. You know. Um, Were so, you ever scared with me? I've never asked you that. Oh hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah, because okay. I mean, hell, I was in jail, you know, oh, yeah. when you were after you were conceived. So yeah, I was scared as shit because 
I, again, well, I'm going to tell you what I was scared of. Let me be honest. I was scared to tell my mama. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I was scared of because I knew my mother was going to hit the roof. And she did, you know, and she did. I remember my, my mother was like, I'm too... I'm too old to be a grandmother. You know, I think she was like 38. Right? Too old, right? Yeah. Too oh, no, old. too young. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Too young. Okay. I'm sorry. She said she was too young to be a grandmother that is at 38. Pretty, pretty young. Well, me being a 15, I was like, man, you old as shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, what are you talking about? You old. Like, <laughs> you're already there. And yeah, you see Grandma. how ignorant you are, you know, yeah. thinking that 38 is old. Yeah. And so, uh, but, but I, you know, I, I made it do what it do. But listen, I can't take credit for a lot of it. It's her mom. You know what I mean? And Yomi's been a great yeah. mom. And, and, and flowers and to her Yomi. parents She's been and her parents and the support of my in-laws, like they really kind of helped and aided to to make it all work. You know, yeah. because that's amazing. Yeah. You had that support, I'm sure. No, which very absolutely. grounding. Oh, absolutely. But then, you know, I think just uh I think wanting to do it different than what my dad had did. I mean, shout out to my dad. We're cool now, but yeah. Just wanting, you know, we want to do it different. You know, we try to do do what we didn't give, what we didn't have, you know. Yeah. Um, and, is you know, you learn along the way. And it's funny. So, you know, for y'all, because my kids are grown. As a parent, those you, you have to grow with your kids as a parent because that relationship mm-hmm. evolves. You know, see, as she gets right. older and she evolves, like we had to evolve with her and sure. understand those dynamics change. Yeah. Like now she, she 30. I know she hate when no, I say her okay. age, but she 30, right? <laughs> I can't deal with her like I did when she was 14. No. You know, I have to kind of respect her individuality. Is that, her was choices. that hard? It was. <laughs> yeah. It was. No, no. But it I was. mean, because yeah. I think when you, do you have children? No. Okay. Mm-mm. When you Never have will. a child, Mm-mm. you know, you mm-hmm. see them. I mean, I've only gotten to seven so mm-hmm. far. And I, of course, relate to him different at seven as when I did when he was three or an infant. Right. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I have a friend who's just uh, had his daughter go to college mm-hmm. and he is really struggling. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, that's different. She's yeah. now out of the house. Mm-hmm. But it's like he keeps saying, like, my little girl, like, maybe I should have another kid, you know, like, <laughs> oh. like he, he's really having a hard time letting mm-hmm. go of that, how he it related to her. Yeah. yeah so anyway. it is hard. And but it's it, you have to it's necessary well he because, gotta let his go at 25 though so i mean he's, yeah because if you yeah. don't if you don't it's just gonna cause issues you know yeah. when you try to deal with them like if they were you know i course, i can't yeah. make her do anything all i can do is is suggest mm-hmm. and, it's funny to, and i know when he's doing it now too which is crazy <laughs> no i do i can it's a tone of voice that he him and my mama they both have it and it's like I know y'all want a parent so bad right now. <laughs> I can feel it. And he can still kind of do this reset like, so I'm just saying. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to just make a, healthy, like you said, I'm gonna make a healthy suggestion. And a healthy like, suggestion. Yeah, yes, like I said, that. I remember my mom still do it to me. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm 42 years old. She's like, I've been thinking about you. I'm like, please don't. I was arguing with my, I have, I have seven. Well, he just turned eight. So he's eight. Eight and ten. Okay. And they go to school uh, in Agora Hills. Mm-hmm. And they were like poking each other and yelling and screaming the whole drive home. And I had stopped at my mom's house. And they just like crossed the line. I don't beat and hit my kids, but I'm very firm with them. If like I said, we're going to go home or I said, all right, hey, I've been asking you guys to get your shit together. You haven't. I'm not cussing at them like that, but like right. now we're going yeah, home. Yeah. But I got real mad. At my mom was like, "I'm gonna talk to you about it." And I was like, "Don't, don't do it right now." Yeah, <laughs> like I'm, I'm a grown ass man. <laughs> yeah, dealing with my two kids. Don't do it. Yeah. I don't want the suggestion. But she caught herself parenting like. But the thing about it <laughs> though, I'm tell you what to but, do. But you know, like I know, and like what hopefully she'll know one day is no matter how grown you get, no matter how old you are, you're still our child. You're still our yeah. baby. Right. And now. When you get to my age and and I'm someone who's buried a parent, right? No matter how grown you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how tough you are, everybody always wants to feel like they're somebody's baby. So mm, it, it, it starts to change as you get older. You start to appreciate that parenting and and yearn for it, you know. So it mm-hmm. it, it 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 circles back around, you know. Um, mm-hmm. but but you have to go through it to get to it, like to understand it. He's trying I to think... be, kick his wisdom because he put his Mr. Rogers sweater on. <laughs> yeah. 
Did you really just call my sh- Mr. Rogers? <laughs> now he's going to give us the old man speech. <laughs> he must have tied his shoes. That, that was, my neighbor. Hey, I was just about to say that. Let's tie our shoes. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what we're doing. You kind of toss it into the other hand. He gave us his 50 year old speech and buttoned his top button. Oh, my gosh. That's funny. <laughs> that was that's a really good one. Funny. Yeah. I know. I think my dad uh, has always had a great way. And it, and it really has hasn't wavered of course maybe the issues of mine have matured but he'd always just say it in a way where he I knew that he knew what was going on mm-hmm. but he didn't have to nail it over the head you mm-hmm. know he would just imply yes. mm-hmm. certain things and then it was kind of left in my court as to do mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. it what I should do with it yep make a good decision or a not so great decision and then go from there, learn from there. And honestly, like that way. And I try to do that with my son was great because then you really learn and you learn Mm -hmm. that failure is a huge part of your success. Right. I mean, for so long I had this fear of failure and I was like, no. And I, it finally hit me one day. I was like, wow, this is really important to maturing Man. and to my growth. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You have to embrace it. You have to like lean into failure. Right. And, and that's part of the process. I learned way more in failure than I did in, in succeeding yeah. way more, you know, and it, and it builds character too. That's it. For and sure. It builds character. For sure. And that's the same thing with her. Like I, you know, she's pretty level headed, you know, uh, I suggest. And if it blows up, then I'm here to support. Yeah. You know, hey, no whose problem. parents? Is, oh, go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mama. And I was going to say, whose parents and style between your parents? Do you mesh both of them? Do you lean towards one? Like, what is that for you now that you're a mom? And yeah, you're it's a great question. My my mother is very soft and gentle in her approach. And my dad was more firm. Um but, you know, like I just explained, mm-hmm. I'm not too heavy handed. And I do think I have kind of a middle ground mm-hmm. in it. I'm, I'm not as nearly as much of a pushover as my mother, <laughs> but I'm, I don't think I'm, I'm quite as firm as my dad. Yeah, I'm, I'm so not the disciplinarian in my house. Is that <laughs> safe to say? It's for sure. With kids? Would y'all say? Oh, never mind. It's Courtney in right now. <laughs> I'm not the disciplinarian. Yeah, but she, she right? also comes from a very yes. ethnic Yes, like, Nigerian. Yes. Nigerian <clears throat> background. That's not American. Yeah, like for me, that's immigrant. Like my kids, I would tell them, like, listen, you know, your mama gonna be home, yes, right? I'd literally. be like, look, man, y'all don't want no <laughs> shit going on. Y'all need <laughs> to get this done. You gonna have to deal with her? Yeah, yeah. Like, okay, your mama. They did yeah, what I was saying. Yeah, no, hey, still listen, to this day, your mama get home. You know your that's mama gonna. You know, <laughs> so cute. they wasn't afraid of me. Like my youngest <laughs> daughter, I remember at like I'm big and you know whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. And I would tell, I would say, so you're not afraid of daddy? She started laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> she started laughing at me. And I was like, so not even a little bit? And she was just like, I can't believe you asked that question. Like, no. Like, no. But laughed at me. <laughs> but mom scared. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mama, now. My mama get that look. And y'all more the- scared of mama than me, I would say, growing up. Okay. Look at Sorry, her. Sorry, wifey. <laughs> <laughs> I know. She's going to be looking at this like, what right. the hell? <laughs> so with your parents, though, and their support and everything you just explained, was that support there as you went into modeling and acting in this career? Because it's a because it's an interesting career field, and I feel like the resounding thing that comes back is that a lot of parents are like, "Oh, no," know? because and and it's a great question because they had also been in it. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so right. They, took you they to the agent. That's- d- yeah, they really did support me, and they saw my level of drive and determination and passion around it. And I came out here when I was 16 years old. I had auditioned for a job in New York that was going to be filming in L.A. And they brought me out here and screen tested me. And that was the deciding factor. I was like, if I get the job, I'm going to stay. If not, I'm not going to be just another blonde, out of work actress. I'm going to go back to New York. And I got the job and I stayed. And I became emancipated so that I could work adult Mm -hmm. hours. Mm -hmm. I did uh, homeschool, you know, with uh, on set with Mm -hmm. teachers. teachers. And um, yeah, so they really believed in me and really encouraged me. And also having that support has helped with the grounding. What was that? What was that breaking that first project? 
Um, well, I had I had already done you know uh, TV and film in New York, but so the, the one soap that, operas, and uh, stuff that yeah, you're yeah, and it's like New York Undercover and mm. Law and Order, mm, and, I love you know like independent New York films Undercover. and yeah, things New York like Undercover's that. Dope. And then it was uh, Unhappily Ever After, mm -hmm. okay. which was a TV series that was kind of uh, not quite a spinoff, but from the creators of Married with Children, so yeah. it was a sitcom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I seen you did a movie with Ice T as well, uh, Gangland. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. How was that? You know, we didn't actually have any scenes okay. together. Okay. Yeah. But we were in the same movie. Oh, so. okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to get right into it. Terminator three. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. T what what is they name? Was it T S was it T T X? T X is my character. T X. Yes. yes. Yeah. Man, how did you go about landing that role? So it was a series of Gosh, maybe ten auditions. Oh wow! What? Yeah, it was uh, it was intense, and I am not really like an action fan per se, mm -hmm. but for some reason, I mean, I had started doing some action roles, like Mortal Kombat mm -hmm. Conquest was mm -hmm. my first action role, a TV series I mm -hmm. did, and I remember that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> and because. I've always been tall. Mm -hmm. I've had a deeper voice. You know, when I was younger, it was sometimes hard to- Would they put you in Mortal to... Kombat, Sonya? Were you a Taja? Uh, I was Taja. Taja. That's right. Yeah, gotcha. it was a different character, yeah. Gotcha. I think it might have been a new character for the series. That they it's funny out. though, because- She's giving a, me Sonya Blade too. There's a Sonya Blade character that you look like you would be like a dead ringer yes, for. Yes, I've heard, I've yeah. heard of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. So, um, so I'd always been, um, it was, sometimes it was hard to cast me because I'd be taller than the guy playing my father mm -hmm. or things mm -hmm. like that when I was 16. <laughs> but I thought, well, here's a role where I don't have to have any limitations. I can look the way I look. I can be the height that I am. I can sound how I am. And I had always loved Robert Patrick in T2. Yeah. I was just blown away and mesmerized by his performance. And later he's become a friend and we did a movie together, and, mm -hmm. which is great. But um, so for me, it was just like something clicked. And I went, oh yeah, this, t this character, the, the, and again, because it was so physical and having the dance background, um, and you know, learning the choreography for action, which was similar to learning dance choreography, it just, yeah, it was just the right fit. And, um, and being inspired by Robert Patrick, even though wanting to create my own character, I went on this journey of very uh, athletic auditions. And it would be, you know, run and jump over the box and fall down and do a somersault and stand up mm. and, you know, look and, um, very like parkour kind of. But this was pre-parkour. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. parkour was not a thing yet. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it was very physical. And um, I, I guess it worked. I, I, they, mm -hmm. I heard that they auditioned. This is, I guess, another flexing moment, as you called it earlier. Flexing. I... Used to have a hard time talking about myself. Uh, my mother would have to do it for me when I was younger. So yeah. <laughs> it's still sometimes I'm like, uh, still, you don't want things to sound too braggy. But um, I, they saw like 10,000 women um, wow, wow, wow. for the audition wow. in various different mm -hmm. countries all over the world. And for some reason, it was just the right, the right wow. fit. 10,000. So that. And I, I like, I like pressure. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I really feel like that inspires me and so anyway I got the job and I went on this journey of getting in the best shape of my life mm -hmm. I put on 10 pounds of, or 15 pounds of muscle mass I had a weight trainer um, I had a mime coach which was actually Jonathan Mostow the director's idea eliminating mm -hmm. all the human traits of like showing exertion while running blinking while firing mm -hmm. a weapon things like this mm -hmm. I worked with the LAPD getting accustomed to using the 45 mm -hmm. Um, I had a nutritionist, Philip Goglia, who's a gentleman I've worked with. Um, he's amazing. And actually it, working with him on that, he's done like worked with all the Marvel actors and things to help them get in their peak physical performance shape. Um, so yeah, I had 
my body fat down to that of an Olympic athlete. And it was, you it looked was, good in that red. Thank list. you. That thank is you. iconic. We need <laughs> thank to you. bring that. So anyway, oh, yeah. so that yeah. was, that was the beginning of, of that journey. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So you answered my next question. Cause I was going to ask you, how did you prepare for that role? Because you had, you didn't have a lot of lines mm-hmm. in that movie, that's but, true. but it was all look and nuance and even, walking like mm-hmm. a machine but still human though mm-hmm. at the same it was a balance there that's right and i wanted to even bring in because i'm a woman those little signs of femininity that maybe weren't in mm-hmm. the script mm-hmm. but bringing to life like when i'm tasting the blood mm-hmm. or there's a moment in the bathroom fight scene where i look in the mirror kind of check myself yes. out mm-hmm. you know things like this and as i was saying uh, beforehand you know there's an importance for even though I'm shooting a gun at people at point blank range, you've got to want to root for me subconsciously in some way, Mm -hmm. you know? And that was really important for me to get across too. Yeah. And then were, but you were still considered a Terminator in that movie. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were the first, that was, that was kind of risky for them to do that to a female Terminator. Cause you know, Terminator had always been Arnold. Arnold. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I and I remember a lot of people are like, who is this woman? <laughs> like, who is this young yeah. woman who's pitted yeah. against this male iconic yeah. figure of cinema history? Right. And I just kept saying to myself, I'm going to show you. I'm mm. going to show you who I am. Oh, you did? What was it like <laughs> working you. with Arnold, though? Like, what's that experience? He's like? great. I mean, he's got this larger-than-life persona. He's mm-hmm. very gracious with his fans. Um, mm-hmm. I learned a lot by working with him on the fight sequences. Um, and, you know, just... Tried not to miss my mark and hit him mm. in the face <laughs> by accident, <laughs> which I didn't. Which I did. Yeah, was he was he sparking up his cigars? Oh, definitely. Yeah, you could always kind of it, like you could s- smell the cigar, and then you went, "Oh, Arnold must be coming to set," you uh, know, before he got there. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever get hurt doing that movie? Luckily, no. Is the mm-hmm. short answer. I mean, I mm-hmm. definitely got bruises. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one scene where I'm. Um, I become magnetized in the particle accelerator and my mm-hmm. body gets stuck mm-hmm. and I was in a harness there. And so there was, there was, you know, some bruising from the mm-hmm. inside of the harness, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But luckily, no. Mm-hmm. Can I dial it back for a second? Yeah. I just have a question. Mm-hmm. You said 10, 10 rounds of auditions. What were the rounds of auditioning? Why was it so many? Is it because of the amount of women or this was you once you got it? <clears throat> it was 10, it was multiple rounds for you. I, Yeah, I must have gone in 10 times. I don't Mm -hmm. think that they really, oftentimes when they're casting, they don't really, I mean, sometimes they're specific, but sometimes they really don't know. Okay. And I remember the wrestler, China, Mm -hmm. uh, China, I guess she's supposed to say China. Uh Yeah. She, there was talk that they wanted her in the role and that um, she was going to do it. So they could have gone that route. You beat out China. (laughs) Girl. <laughs> and then another flex <laughs> i think thank you <laughs> i think uh that jonathan mostow really wanted to find someone that was his own discovery you mm-hmm. know that was kind of a relative unknown even though i'd worked quite mm-hmm. a bit mm-hmm. um i hadn't been on a stage that big before right. so to speak okay. so right. yeah got you and that was going into my my next thing you're right on point mm-hmm. so <laughs> did things did things change drastically for you in your career after doing because now this box office was how many hundreds of millions now you're yeah it was the highest grossing film to date when it came out okay so when you do that what changes again i i remember jonathan telling me you know you're not going to be able to pump gas without people Mm -hmm. recognizing you those were his words and and when he called me to let me know that I got the job. Mm -hmm. I was riding my friend's horse in Griffith Park. Mm -hmm. I'll remember it exactly. We were just crossing the bridge by Circle K. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Any listeners out there ride and ride there, they'll know where that spot is. And um, he's like, are you ready? Because your life is going to completely change. And Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, bring it. Mm -hmm. And it was wild to be under that kind of worldwide scrutiny. Yes. Um, But I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Yeah. So once the movie comes out, though, and I mean, it's critically acclaimed. Everybody Mm -hmm. loves it. They receive it well. It makes money. 
I mean, how did things change for you in your career and in your personal life? Like, or is everybody, you know, on Kristana now? Everybody wants you a piece of you. They want you to be in their movies and Dating. personally yeah. as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, it was. Uh, it's it's interesting. You could see, I, I I was able, thankfully, to see through the veil mm -hmm. pretty well okay. of like how people were just wanting to use you, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, you know, I've always tried to just really remain true to myself mm -hmm. and, and be me. I don't really think I've, I've changed that much in it. I mm -hmm. think I've always been pretty discerning about people's character mm -hmm. and I, you know, I could, I could see through it, but yes, it was, that was definitely different for sure. Okay. Did, did the jobs come pouring in and the offers? Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, certainly it opened up various doors and on a worldwide stage, yes. you know, and working abroad, which was right. great. Um, but, you know, it's it's a hard business. Yeah. And is. you no matter what, because people say, OK, we saw you do that. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. But what's next? What's next? You know, yeah. show us what what else is in your box. And of especially tricks. when you have something that big, you know, mm -hmm. it, it makes it actually even more difficult so you know. iconic uh, you know yes. um so it's but that's the fun of being an actor right as you get mm -hmm. to mix it up mm -hmm. um, but yes i mean certainly did a lot of action after mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and um and you know of course drama too um mm -hmm. and sci-fi yeah and did so you, it, go ahead go oh ahead, no say so did you could you say you weren't a fan of action did you get into action after that did you become more of a fan of it I, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I was a fan of of doing it. Okay. I always enjoyed doing mm -hmm. action because, again, it's something yes. that makes sense to me mm -hmm. uh, physically. And and uh, although, although I can be a, a, certainly a critique, like mm -hmm. these women that I see in action films sometimes, I will not mention any names, <laughs> but who are running around in three inch spikes mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I trained in heels. I mm -hmm. had to train in running in heels at, at UCLA as a matter of fact <laughs> mm -hmm. on the track. And I remember training in heels. They weren't three inch. They were like two inch, but Arnold wore mm -hmm. boots. And I, mm -hmm. and I remember some of the kids on the track, they, they came up to me and they're like, man, your coach is cold. Like, <laughs> can you really like sprint in heels. But I learned, I learned how to sprint wow. on the balls of my feet. That's another story. But, um, uh, where was I going with this? Oh, actually, if you were a fan of action, oh, the after, action. But yes, you yes, like yes. doing it. Yes. Right. So these women who I, I just can't buy them mm -hmm. doing it. Like you've got yeah, to have, no. you know, I'm not I a agree. small woman, right. you know, I'm, your tone. Like, you look, you look oh, like thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Like you have, to, if you're going to be doing it, you got to sell it, man. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to have some they're muscle to... tone. You've got to have, <laughs> <laughs> they are. <laughs> you've got to have, you know, and some women do it really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got, I got to work with Zoe Bell mm -hmm. who comes to mind. Um, and um, I mean, I know she comes from the stunt world, right. mm -hmm. but like, I mean, she's incredible at what yeah. she does. And, yeah. um, you know, and there are various there are various others that just on an on a side, like look at Sigourney Weaver. I mean, mm -hmm. she really yes. pioneered that oh, yeah. whole mm -hmm. movement yeah, species, you know. Yeah. So you don't have to just come from the stunt world, obviously, to, but mm -hmm. it's it's some kind of an embodiment yes. um, that I think is important to carry through. And you have a background in martial arts as well. No, not okay. really. I okay. mean, I've I, I think that may be out there on the internet somewhere, but that's not really true. Oh, okay. I mean, I've I've studied it <laughs> yeah. because of the roles that I've done, okay. but I am I am not a martial artist. Oh, no. Okay. No, I just Christina, hopefully you should have just went with it. it. You should have just, just acted with it and went with it. Oh yeah, you know I got black belt and you know full degree, full Dan. She don't fake the funk. No, it's true. So. So as you, I mean, you you get in modeling and you're acting and you have this blockbuster film, then at some point you pivot and you put your producer cap on. That's right. And yep. you produce uh, Fighting for Freedom. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, coming off a blockbuster film, what made you want to, you know, get behind the camera? Mm hmm. Actually, there was even a film um, preceding that called mm. Lime Salted Love that mm. I produced first um, mm. with some friends from acting class. Um, but Fighting for Freedom is a very special film because my dad wrote it. 
Oh, and we wow. shot it on my parents' farm <clears throat> and in Hudson in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And Bruce Stern, legend, uh, two-time Academy Award nominee, plays my dad. And I, it just made sense to have that role as producer. I think mm -hmm. if you've been in this business for a while and you've had your eyes open <clears throat> and you have some sort of ambition, you go, oh, well, I want to be the conductor you know, I want to mm -hmm. be the one pulling the strings. I want to put all the people together to help create my vision, mm -hmm. whatever that is. So mm -hmm. from there, um, I also produced some other films, but uh, I started a company called uh, Trio Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And we are about to release uh, next year um, a feature called Vice and Virtue, uh, which is two celestial beings, Vice and Virtue, come down to Earth um, and they impose this judgment day on about half a dozen people that find themselves in an undisclosed location. Mm -hmm. So over the course of this night, these people are in mm -hmm. life or death situations, and it looks at our choice points and how some choices take us in one direction and some take us in the other. So like what will that. these people choose, mm -hmm. essentially? Is it more gratifying for you um, to be a producer or an actor? Acting is my passion. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm also in Vice and Virtue, uh, mm -hmm. but I, producing is is great too. Yeah. I'm learning. I'm well, still I'm still learning. So as a business model, but as a as a also as a brand and as businesswoman, do you do you see the value more in being a producer opposed to being an actress? Well, it certainly opens up more possibilities, mm -hmm. right? Right. It's like if you can wear more hats, yeah. why not? That's I mean, right. I'd like to actually try directing next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yes. think I'm really, I think I'm ready now yeah. to do that. Yeah, it's an extra line item. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I can more get three line paychecks. Items yeah. Perfect. There you, go. <laughs> there you go. So, segueing into my next question, what is your favorite vampire movie? Well, I did one. I know. Yep. That's yep. why I'm asking you what your favorite one but is. But my favorite uh. is Interview with a Vampire. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not yours. Hey, what did you say? From Dust Till yeah, Dawn yeah. or some yeah, 80s? Yeah, I mean, Lost Interview Boys. with a Vampire. That was, so, that was classic. And the show yeah. was good. I mean, but it wasn't like vampire, vampire. Like, they wasn't like monstering, you know? You didn't mean? like the romance nah, aspect of nah, it. Yeah. I, want them to I did. Eat yes. People, yeah. You know, suck blood and. and fly and turn into something it, yeah it wasn't gruesome yes maybe you like the the yes. gray i just like of it. traditional like fright night is mine yes okay fright i have not seen fright night oh sorry come on christana come on now i'm sorry to let you down how you ain't seen <laughs> everybody's like what? You obviously this seen... is a household favorite <laughs> how you ain't seen fright night with chris not. do you know chris Sarandon? No. Oh, okay. Well, we got to have a movie night. Now. I was that's, say, it. Chris, that's it. I'm going to come gonna over. Say, Chris, come get your I'll girl, bring some man. popcorn. <laughs> right. there we so go. you really never seen Fright Night, huh? I have not. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. So your favorite in interview with a vampire. Yeah. So you do Blood Rain, right? Yep. Um, And that was your first time playing a vampire. And doing horror? Was it Actually, a damn fear. So I'm a hybrid. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So kind of like vampire, Blade. Half, yeah. Like Blade. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, it was yes, it was my first vampire movie, mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's actually horror per se. It's kind of sci-fi-ish a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but it's it's definitely fantasy. Yes, fantasy. And definitely would be, yes. bloody. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. but I like the whole aspect. Uh, what's what's intriguing to me about vampire films is, of course. One, we can live forever. Mm -hmm. And two, that you take someone's blood, their life force to sustain your own. Like, mm -hmm. and then there's that whole erotic kind of sensual mm -hmm. aspect of it. The glamour. It's all wrapped yeah. into one. <laughs> and it's and it's a big like I mean, I think what I liked about Interview with a Vampire mm -hmm. is when they start to have the self-realization of like, I can't, I can't kill people to sustain my own life mm -hmm. anymore because mm -hmm. it's not worth it you know when they yeah. get to that end point of living through all these years mm -hmm. and you know at, to what end do we want to live yeah um there's not there's an interesting question in there with with you i'm gonna ask you christana um would you want to live forever if you could no yeah, I don't think maybe. so because, and ironically, I was just listening to something um, 
before coming over here tonight about, you know, in the in the tech world, how there's all this intrigue about um, eternal life yes. and and creating that and how do we sustain our life and then you think about Black what would mayor. that do mm -hmm. to the right what saying. would that do to the world yeah i mean i think the whole world would crumble if everybody lived forever mm -hmm. i mean i don't think that's the sustainable part i think like you look at elon just i think he just got approval for that Neuralink like thing that he's trying out um it's like basically wow. a computer chip mm -hmm. uh, it's it's way deeper you have to look yeah. into it but yeah, he it's just too got much a, already he, yeah. he just got <laughs> approval for a, basically like a computer chip ai thing that he's trying mm -hmm. to create called Neuralink. Mm -hmm. they've showed examples of like they've they did a chimpanzee i think and like they put this chip in and he was able to control things by thinking them and then the computer yeah, relays. That's too much. That's too dangerous. Much. Yeah. But yeah, I think the much. thought is more, if if you guys are fans of the Matrix or have seen mm -hmm. it, it's more of just cocooned people, yeah, like linked up, mm. less of people mm -hmm. living forever. Because I don't think the physical body can live forever. Mm -hmm. But I no. think maybe the consciousness this and transfer it, yeah. like in Black Mirror, like yeah. you got a real death, then you got the computer death, where it's yeah. like we can stream your consciousness into another body or another organism. I think that's weird. And yeah. I think that's just. Very, very you know. I definitely wouldn't want to live live mm -mm. forever, and especially live forever forever like a vampire, and everybody else around you dies. I've, been, oh, I've already. It's buried. hard enough How now losing people at this be? age. Right. I've already you know? buried too many right. people that I. Don't that's know. what I was about to say. Yeah. Like, yeah. can you imagine just literally wow. everybody that you know? You know, you're not. Gonna, for years, and, and it keeps era. going. Every, every it keeps era, going. right? Yeah. Then every <laughs> you meet other people, you fall in love with them. Oh, then they're gone. Then yeah. this, you know, my yeah. gosh, you're. Oh, you know, I mean, no wonder you flying around here sucking blood. Exactly. I probably would too. So with Blood Rain, that was a pretty big budgeted film, wasn't it? What, why do you think that Blood Rain didn't really connect um, in terms of like box office and just with, with fans like that? It was adapted, obviously, from the video game. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, uh, I think there were some, there were some distribution issues that okay. I won't go into, but okay. I think that that um, was difficult. And um, I don't know, maybe the execution could have been slightly different. I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard to say. You never okay. know what's going to land right. with That's people That's right. Historically, video That's game right. adaptations haven't really it's worked true. well. That's Until true. The Last of Us recently as a episodic. Did you see that? Mm -mm. It's a streaming series, but the oh, last... Oh, that's all of a video game? Last of Us is from oh, a video game. Okay. Oh, wow. And it did very well. I didn't know that. But it's like the first, because people are like, yeah, I mean, historically. Was, wasn't Resident Evil a video mm -hmm. game? Resident okay. Evil. But yeah. Resident Evil has its like yeah. hiccups too with people saying that right, it right. never really translated. Because it's like part it. 20 or something, right? It's like a it's bunch like of a lot of it, yeah. Yeah. So after you do all that, you, you know, you go to a very popular show, The L Word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait, so. what year? Because wifey used to watch that. What year? Uh, <laughs> it was, I think it was three. Yeah. Yeah, I was in season three, and then I think in the beginning of four, like mm -hmm. maybe just ah. the first episode or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what was your experience like with the L word? Um, you know, I was really happy and excited to be invited onto the cast. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at the time it was a complete pioneer. I mean, nobody mm -hmm. else no, had done right. a TV show like that. That's true. Um, and I think it's important to be able to promote loving whom you choose. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my sister always um, supported that. I mean, I've been outspoken about, you know, dating men and women. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, the more that things are spoken about, mm -hmm. um, the less of a stigma it becomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at it now, even how many years is it later, 15 years later, the scope of things has changed mm -hmm. so much mm -hmm. because people, Talk about it, right. you know, and I think that's that's I mean, the most important. They thing. say there's nothing new under the sun, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's just become more acceptable. Do you consider yourself? Well, let me ask you: When you did the L word, um, had you already identified um, yourself as? Uh, is, would, would you say you're bisexual? Or would you say yeah. you're sapiosexual? I don't, what's sapios? I, there's all these new terms that I don't think I'm quite up meaning, on yet. Meaning that you, it, it's more. Um, 
intellectual intellectual like rather man or woman just who you who stimulates you intellectually and that's who you kind of i don't know if that's any different than bisexual anyway is maybe it? i don't know I, maybe it is i mean for me I'm it guessing. is always about the person i'm guessing okay yeah so first. maybe a little yeah. maybe a little bit Did and you... yes i had been okay. i'd be, already been outspoken and i think as soon okay. as they caught wind of that you know it mm -hmm. was like we got to get her on the show <laughs> because a lot of people at that yeah. time weren't talking about it right you know right but again with the support of my sister um you know it was like why it's it's a non-issue you right. know it should never be an issue right right that was a pretty big show though oh you? it was mm -hmm. huge yeah. yeah did you win did that show win any awards probably okay <laughs> <laughs> you say you just did the work and kept <laughs> yeah. it moving yeah. huh? you know it's funny it's funny to say that you have to talk about it and it should be a non-issue but it's Going back to like the Me Too movement, it, it continues to be an issue. You've seen mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade overturned. Mm -hmm. and oh seen, my gosh! And you've seen as soon as they overturned it, what uh, the Supreme, the Black Supreme Court justice, mm -hmm. he was the first one to be like, "Yeah, we're gonna go after gay rights next." <laughs> yeah, right. that was the next That's thing right. we were targeting. Yeah. I was yeah, like, I "We're we're overturning women's rights and gay rights now." That's yeah, what it's we're crazy. Doing. Yeah, like. That's yeah, a, that doesn't seem. I would never understand how you can tell a woman what like I can never wrap my head around mm -mm. that. No, what to do with your body? That's crazy. And That's your, crazy. Your, yeah. Yeah. So we we again, it should be a non-issue, but it keeps become somehow. Well, mm -hmm. it's it's evolved. I mean, for yeah. sure, since that time, and I think it's because of shows like The L Word mm -hmm. that you know showed same sex relationships in yeah albeit slightly more glamorous mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but like normal mm -hmm. you know day to day experiences and my character on the show um was bisexual if mm -hmm. i'm remembering correctly and she had a son and that's how she meets the love interest Kate mm -hmm. Menig's character um who had a younger much younger brother um, so again, it's like, you know, this, mm. this is a real experience. This is a real family, you know, and there were other couples, you know, that had a child on it. And mm. so I think it helped see couples in a different light. But that's crazy. The fact that you have to humanize other people, I like know. you're already human. They right. already, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's so weird. It's a lack of respect. It goes exactly. back to like the other yeah. thing where it's. Being that your parents are obviously from a different generation, were they supportive in, in that? With me? Yes. In the show? No. Or on in, a personal level? Be, yeah, on a well, personal level. Well, your sister, I guess. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, my sister really broke the mold. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think they ultimately just really want their daughters to be happy. Okay. You know, wherever, wherever that went. I think for them, you know, they still were under the guise of, you know, well, it's easier, you know, to be in a heterosexual relationship, mm -hmm. you know, and we want an easy life for right. you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, I think whomever I was with, you know, they mm -hmm. would, they would support. Okay. Oh, that's dope. That's dope. Mm -hmm. Um, now fast forward to strike. Mm -hmm. So finally done with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on the strike? And well, let me just ask that that first part question. What did did you agree with what they were fighting for? Uh, oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There really needed to be an overhaul um, on so many levels within um, the guild. And you know, I've been a member of the guild for many many years now, but I never really knew what my position was until recently when I really had to look at it. <clears throat> and through COVID, uh, people started, producers started to, um, because of these hefty uh, COVID compliance fees, they wanted you to start working um, non-union. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they'd throw a lot of extra money out there. Hey, do my project and I'll pay you X amount. And, you know, it's non-union. And I was like, I'd never been asked to do a non-union project I mean, maybe in, since the very beginning of my career because mm -hmm. nobody did that before. I mean, this is just one example, right? Mm -hmm. But there are all these ways and loopholes where producers started to try to get crafty. And I was like, this is not fair. This is not right. Mm -hmm. I have worked long and hard to have the position that I have within the union and to get paid into my pension and health and for my child. Um, and that needs to be upheld and I shouldn't have to work in a in a way that's um 
sub level and subpar to what I've been doing. And, you know, I ended up actually, um, because there's all other things I could lose. I could mm -hmm. lose in, um, my standing in the union mm -hmm. and thereby be blacklisted and never be able to do a union project again. Mm -hmm. Um, I could never have the opportunity uh, to, if even if I declared FICOR, which is another level, a financial core, you could do, do a hybrid, but then you also lose um, ever getting nominated for a Screen Actors Guild Award. You know, you're kind of demoted. There's all of these reasons why I, I mean, and look, everybody can do what they want to do. That's their choice. But I really sat with why it was important for me mm -hmm. to uphold that. And I, and I turned away a lot of money um, for my beliefs, I mean, that's just how I am, um, to really stand for that. And, uh, I actually wrote letters to various producers during that time who asked me to work uh, non-union and explaining why it was really important. You know, Hey, I'd love to do your job. I'd love to make the money and I'd, you know, I'd love to work with you, but these are the reasons why I'm holding out and so anyway, that whole voice and, and they actually responded to me favorably and they said, you know what? Thank you. We mm -hmm. appreciate that. And, you know, when we have a union project, we'll let you know. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad that it's now done. Yeah. And for what was it? 118 days or whatever right. it was, yeah. you know, that we stood in solidarity. And I really felt proud mm -hmm. of being a union member um, and and them having our back. I mean, that's the other thing, too. Like, we need to stand together as union members so that they can support us in the ways that we need to be supported. Mm -hmm. Does the three year part make you nervous? No, because I think if we can do what we did this time around, mm -hmm. I don't think that they would renege. I think if anything, after three years, if the evolution of things keeps evolving as fast as it has mm -hmm. been, we'd have to get an even better agreement. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Do you think you could find yourselves in the same predicament in three years? Hopefully not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the one loose cannon or the biggest loose cannon would be AI. I think that's what everybody's thinking. Yes, that was thinking. my next question, yeah. Um, yeah. But again, with the best AI that I have seen, mm -hmm. it's not a human. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have the human nuance. It doesn't have the human reactivity. It doesn't mm -hmm. have the human emotional life. Right. There's something devoid. Mm -hmm. So you can't replace that. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like AI in terms of being a creative, do you feel like that it's it's something that could be useful or do you feel threatened by it? So interesting because she was Terminator. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. To even be right. having the exactly. conversation. Exactly. Like, exactly. Right. It's, the machines will Skynet. rise yeah. and become <laughs> self-aware. Yeah. Huh? It's true. <laughs> Um, she was talking about how she had to become devoid of human yeah, to become right. a character. When she said right. it, that's exactly what yeah. I thought. Like, yeah. But you the whole Terminator. Yeah. Over there. <laughs> you know, I've always been of the mindset, like if I can't feel it, touch it, taste it, hold it, or smell it, I can't mm -hmm. relate to it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've had a bit of a, a kind of an away from aspect with the whole AI mm -hmm. movement. Although I do see the value to it, mm -hmm. you know, chat GPT, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, what it can do and how it can break things down and mm -hmm. how it can help you figure in, figure things out and streamline. And it is incredible, <clears throat> but it's all because of human inputted information to right. begin with. Right. Um, so I, going back to your question, what was the new, the new, well, I was saying, question? do you think it would be helpful or are you afraid of it? I think it can be a really helpful mm -hmm. tool. Um, so I think used in the right yes. ways. Um, but, but most people, you know, like we know, they find a way to abuse it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and sure. exploit it. And exploit yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not going to stay up sleepless nights <laughs> worrying about it. Right. <laughs> we're just, move, we're moving adjust. in that direction. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. It's like it's, social media. Exactly. Like it's, it's happening. Yeah. And yeah. it will continue to evolve. And if it's happening on social media, then it's real. What are your <laughs> Absolutely. Being we're from a different generation, what are your thoughts on social media? How did you get acclimated to this social media world? Just being constantly, you know, just uh, have access to and people want to see what you got it going on. It was really hard for me. 
And I I still am not a huge fan, to be honest. I'm not a big social media person. Mm -hmm. I do see the value and I do see, um, you know, the enjoyment of the feed, the give and take firsthand Mm -hmm. with fans and that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, But way back when with MySpace, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, I remember reading some things. I remember the exact moment where I was sitting and reading things on there that were like, ooh, Mm-hmm. This is too much. Yeah. Like, I don't need to have this enter my world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I really don't. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to. And maybe that's still my thought about AI. I'm like, well, yeah, these things are mm-hmm. out there. I don't have to b- be privy to them on a deep, deep level only as much as I need to yeah. or mm-hmm. want to be. Somebody recently said, like, the most intelligent shit I had heard of. It was Tiffany. Tiffany Haddish. I was thinking about the same Tiffany thing. Haddish, I just didn't want to say it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just didn't yeah. want to say it. What did she uh, say? Yeah. She said that amount of information mm-hmm. for her, mm-hmm. and just for humans in general, it's not healthy. Is, is not yeah. healthy. It's not, you can't like look at a dead baby one second mm-hmm. and then scroll and see someone. And then see then someone this. popping a pimple and then see someone kissing yeah. and yeah. then a yeah. funny cat video. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, I can't fucking just. Yeah. yeah. It's like. In the matter of seconds, scrolling that All many the, different emotions. I've really <laughs> sheltered my son a lot from mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah. I, I Here's an interesting fact. I don't have a screen in my house. I mean, I have, I have, I shouldn't say I have screens if I need them for certain projects mm-hmm. or like, you know, obviously computer, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't do screens with him. I should, mm-hmm. I should more off say that Mm -hmm. like we don't do tv um Mm -hmm. or video games or things like that um and um you know he does he is exposed at Mm -hmm. other people's homes Mm -hmm. um but i think there's something really important about experiencing the world you yeah. know, and I see so mm-hmm. many kids, yeah. absolutely babies, infants yeah. like this, absolutely yeah. addicted yeah. in the phone. And it's not healthy. It's like, this is our world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is our life experience. Yeah. There's so much else out there. And of yeah. course, I love great cinema and the mm-hmm. arts and television. Right. And I can so appreciate it. It's not that I'm, of course, anti. Right. But I think in creating our own personal human development, mm-hmm. We need to get, we need to be doing more of this, the interaction with humanity. You have a peaceful home, I can imagine. I didn't have a TV for two years and it was lovely. I really enjoyed it. I I agree. I think it's so funny because with technology, it's a gift and a curse, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, because I miss the days of when we were just able to be present. You know, you you know, you didn't have the phone. Only a few people had pagers back in the day. Right. But for the most part, doctors. Yeah. 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 Right. Or other kind of pharmacists. You know. Yeah. But you. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean. You know. So, but you were able to be present. Somebody call your house. They leave a message. Right. Hell, you talk to them when you talk to them. Right. You know. And you weren't um, so accessible. That's, yeah, that's what I hate. I hate exactly. That. I hate, I hate that the part where people feel so Everything entitled to your energy. But people right. feel entitled to your energy. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. 9 30. Like, they haven't answered my email. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, they've got a life. They've yeah. got a home. They've got a family. It's you interesting know? that you say that being an entertainment that you don't have a screen. Obviously, you know, I, I run these studios, but in my house, I don't keep screens on and i sent my kids to a waldorf school. i went to a waldorf school <laughs> now i'm not as good as you because they've been exposed to some i just had a power ranger here mm-hmm. and i said yeah my kids have seen it but <laughs> we did very limited like my kids still haven't seen any of the disney movies mm-hmm. so we that's would, great we would go to things and people would be like oh frozen they'd be acting stuff out my kids yeah. would be like yeah. do you give them a lot of time yeah, yeah. Uh, now, now I do no that's great bit. my mom did that with me because my my <laughs> oldest is about to go into junior high it's really mm-hmm. hard for him at this point mm. and it's mm-hmm. he's still in a waldorf and the junior high is also waldorf like inspired so that's great it's very mm-hmm. much like connection to like nature and go out mm-hmm. and do oh some, it is it's yeah sp- i loved going to a waldorf school i sent um my son also to a waldorf school in yeah. the beginning now he's at a, a montessori school but yeah i loved it and it is it's very experiential yeah um and i think if you can get the enjoyment out of just being yes that's yeah. the essence of life yeah. right and because that's all gonna come to them all that technology is coming exactly yeah. it's unavoidable no you know? it's right it's right but i think it's just lack of balance but like even in your field um and i don't know if you run into this yet but because of social media 
I mean, you as a classically trained thespian who's done the work and put the work in and also has the resume, you could very well lose a job to someone that has a million followers. It's possible. Yeah. Like how yeah. silly is that? Right. And they could have got the million just trending off exactly. of one goofy video. Right. Exactly. Which is like, what? yeah. That's yeah. the world that we live and, in. And, you know, I, I can't... Um, Again, I can't go down the rabbit hole mm -hmm. with that because mm -hmm. I am how I am mm -hmm. and I enjoy the choices I've made around technology. Again, it's an incredible tool and yes. you know, the way that in which that we use it can be very powerful, but it can also be, you know, uh, a detriment too. Yeah. So. Talk to me about Dark Knight of the Soul. So yeah. that's the film that I was mm -hmm. telling you about in the beginning mm -hmm. uh, of our interview and um I think it'll be I think it'll be a powerful film. As I mentioned, it's a very it's a very intense film with what this woman is is going through. Um, but uh, I don't you I mean, do you want me to recap it? Because I already talked about it. So maybe um, so she's bleeding out. It seems very introspective. Like, yes, I, I didn't touch on that. You're right. So movie starts out. Um, I get into a car accident. I'm pinned in this car. So Dark Knight of the Soul, inspired by this poem, looking at your life in your dark night to potentially move to the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So through this blood loss in her leg, um, she starts to hallucinate. So she has this projected conversation with her father, who's been dead for 15 years, played by Martin Cove. She has flashbacks of a conversation with her sister, and she's trying to come to terms with the fact that she's got this high position at the CDC. Her husband and daughter were patient one and two, but she's not found a cure. And um, is she ready to move on into death and accept her fate? Or does she have more fight to give and to live? And does she have more important things to do with her life? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so it's an intense journey of of the mind, of mm -hmm. the reflective aspect mm -hmm. of like, you know, when people talk about looking <clears throat> death in the face and what do they yeah. see? They see the 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 white tunnel of light and flashes of memory. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll we we'll, we won't know until we do know. Yeah. Yeah. Um I just finished reading this great book last night called um The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. It's a New York Times number 1 bestseller. It's a fabulous book, and it looks at this woman who's about to kill herself and where she gets trapped in a place of this library of all these different alternate realities of our life. So Dark Knight of the Soul, in that vein, begs the question of, are we good with where we're at in our life, with mm -hmm. our human existence? Mm -hmm. And if we're not, we got to get good because this is our life. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a beautiful movie that I think was slept on it's not exactly the same, but it's so interesting now knowing that, that we lost the talent to suicide was um, What Dreams May Come. Did you ever watch that? Oh, with Robin Williams. With Robin Williams. Did it's you ever an see incredible that? book. With Cuba Gooding Jr. and Robin Williams. I mean, book, I've, I've read the book too. Such mm -hmm. an incredible film. Great book. And I actually, it's funny you bring that one up because I mentioned that to the cinematographer of this film as a reference point because it's it has that film. dream. Like it's a beautiful film. Yeah. yeah. And actually my, my good friend, her grandfather um, was the writer who wrote the book. And mm -hmm. how What's the name of it again? What dreams may come. Okay. Yeah. So interesting too, because it's a journey for him to connect to his wife who killed herself. Mm -hmm. and it was a suicide. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we lose them to yeah. that very same thing. That's right. But it was very introspective. Wow. It was, are we good? Like, there's the whole thing with Cuba and the storyline with his son. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to ruin it for anyone. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's wonderful. I just rewatched it. But you talking it. about yeah. yours made me think, like, oh. For I'm, sure. I love films like that. And I love yeah. uh, that film. So definitely. Where do we see yeah. it at? Or where can we? Well, um, we'll do the festival circuit. Mm -hmm. um and then it'll be out mm. later next year i'm not sure exactly yeah. yet what their plan is for release okay. but and the homie that you mentioned what you said martin cole that's the that's karate kid that's, that's right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. that's uh cobra kai yeah oh he loves cobra yeah kai. yeah yeah that's <laughs> the og that's the og from uh cobra kai that's yeah. it yeah that's it yeah he <laughs> yeah he's my dad okay nice nice what how was it working with him he's great he's yeah. great he's a lot of fun he's mm -hmm. very likable <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, he was he was great. 
Okay. Well, what else you got uh, coming so up? So I've got, time? as I mentioned, Vice and Virtue, and then a film called uh, Darkness of Man, mm -hmm. um, where I play Jean-Claude Van Damme's love interest. Wow. Love and love that'll that. be in Damme. theaters. Um, they haven't set a release date, maybe February. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, we should know soon. And uh, that's like a neo-noir mm -hmm. thriller um, with, of course, a little bit of action. Are you doing? In there, are you doing action? Ironically, no. Oh, okay. not in this one. Okay. No, maybe in the sequel. All right. We'll set it up for that. <laughs> we'll leave it there at that. But, um, but yeah, dark. Uh, they're both with dark in the title. That's Darkness of Man, mm -hmm. and then um, also No Address, as I said, the mm -hmm. the movie about the homeless crisis. Mm -hmm. So. Well, hey, you got anything, daughter? No, I've enjoyed this. <laughs> yeah, uh, Courtney. Uh, the third, do you have anything you want to ask Miss Cristana? Yeah, thank you very much. I was like, that's all I need to know. <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's it. Good. I'm so glad. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, shoot. Well, that's it. We'll close it on out. Man, we appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Hey, taking your time to come here, Christina. I really appreciate you, you know, uh, for yes. blessing us with your time mm -hmm. and sitting down and, and telling us your journey and, and sharing your wonderful thoughts and, and path with us. So we, we appreciate that. It's my absolute pleasure. I feel like I was just sitting, hanging out with a bunch of old friends. This was great. Absolutely. It was so relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> great questions. And yeah. I love where the conversation went. So yeah. it, went, it was in some weird places at times. It did. It did. <laughs> I, I could just, all I could think of is him stabbing people at Chipotle. <laughs> Man, That's that, all was, that was humanitarian. That's that was humanitarian. humanitarian. <laughs> Fear not, homeless community. <laughs> if you see a, if you get a random fork stuck up your mouth when you sleep, then you just know, know I'm love. checking on you. Yeah, just know love. I'm checking on you. Yeah. I'm doing my humanly yeah. duties. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> but no, it's all good. So, listen, we out of here. Holding Court Podcast. Uh, Rachel Renee, oh, yeah. producer Ken, and Kristana Loken. Thank you again. Thank you. All right, we out of here. <laughs>